getting lit. Welcome to the One Life One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morris. I had a matcha latte this morning, thanks to my guest today, a friend for over 20 years. I know this kid since he was in his diapers. Uh, we've lived together, we've toured together, we've loved together. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, Mr. <laughs> Chad Gilbert. What's up? <laughs> we have, lo- did you say lived or loved? <laughs> we <both>. love, <laughs> lived and loved together. Um, actually, that I is true. I actually have a Chad Ball tattoo. And, I have um, a Toby tattoo. On your toes. On my toe. I have a um, letter B. <laughs> so before we get into our Bud Kid, Bud Kid life, I want to take you back to your you growing up. I know you're born in South Florida, um, mm-hmm. Coral Springs, to be exact. Coral Springs. And then, what is your connection to Kentucky? Um, all my family is. For, well, first off, thank you for having me, Toby. Of course, I'm thank, really thanks excited for being. I'm that excited you're doing too. this. Welcome back to the old stomping grounds. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, I uh, my family's from Lexington, Kentucky. My mom and my dad uh, were born and raised in Lexington. And they actually uh, wanted to have a give me and my older brother a more cultured life. Awesome. Because um, at the time, yeah, they just they they knew about South Florida, and and they wanted to uh, yeah just move move down there in a melting pot society. I like that. Yeah, it was cool. Multicultural. And um, yeah, we moved to Florida. Well, I was they moved to Florida. And had me and my older brother, but all my family, um, everyone else, cousins. Grandma, R.I.P. Nana, who just passed away in yeah, December. Rest in peace. Um, all lived in, still lived in Lexington. So two times a year, we'd go up and visit the family and stuff like that. Um, and, and my brother ended up going to University of Kentucky, um, awesome. which is uh, Lexington, and Kentucky doesn't have any pro sports teams. Yeah. So the UK basketball team is like their pro sports team. So like all your life, you just are given blue. I mean, even Max, <laughs> when my, it's, so remember that? Jersey, yeah, back in the day. <laughs> when Max was really little, my mom <laughs> mailed uh, Toby and Moon a K- Kentucky basketball jersey he wore for Max. for a long time, So too. you see, we spread it. You do. It's like, you, always re- you always rep it, too. Yeah. Um, all right, so what was it like growing up there? Um, how were you in school? Um, <clears throat> all that. Yeah, so I feel like me in school, I was, you know, it's like what you would see on some, like, T- like TV show or, or an, an old John Hughes movie, you know, like okay. where we were like, I was a freak. I had dyed hair. Yeah, I'd, I'd sheet. wear, yeah, goofy clothes and just wear what I wanted. And me and my, you know, four weirdo friends would sit at a lunch table and everyone else would like look at us and we would be sitting there planning on how to take over the world. Yeah. Like all, <laughs> like what we all do. Like everyone else is stupid. We're smart. Um, but you, I mean, you got, you got into music young and you, and you started playing young. So, before leading up to that, what were you into before you started playing guitar? And like, what was that connection to probably punk and skateboarding? I think you skated too. Yeah. So I was, um, <clears throat> well, I always loved music uh, from the, when I was really little, I used to like bring in the neighborhood and sing Tomorrow from Annie. Awesome. To all the neighbor- like I was really little, like for some reason I just always, music always clicked with me. Yeah. Um, and, but the punk connection was my older brother when he went to high school, him and he had a punk rock friend. So they would always bring home their CDs and yeah. tapes and whatever, and then got me into it. Yeah. So, and I was at the time I was five years younger than my brother. So I started really young. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> me not even realizing the legendary show it was like my brother took me to see Fugazi when I was in the fourth grade. That's amazing. And it was the shake your leg tour. Yeah. Shudder to think and Fugazi. Wow. And, and so I loved Fugazi, but I didn't know, I didn't understand what it was. Mm -hmm. I just loved, you know, Green Day, Fugazi, Nirvana, kind of just anything. Yeah. You know, anything loud that the kids at school didn't know. Exactly. Danzig, like any, any, (laughs) anything, you know? Yeah. I didn't know the difference in in genres and genres. So when my brother took me to the Fugazi show and I saw that, because before the Fugazi show, everything I've seen for live music was on TV. So these big lights and concerts and whatever. Yeah. But then you go to this show in this club and it's just like this whole subculture and everyone's hanging out and there's these hang, you know clicks and Fugazi's talking to the crowd and yelling at the crowd and like intimate yeah the yeah. singer of Shudder to Think is like telling the skinhead that he'll give him a blowjob out back after the show Damn. <laughs> he was like start, <laughs> he was starting crap That's so with shocking the, he was starting you. crap with the, the skinheads you know because it was like skinheads waiting to see Fugazi and yeah so it was it was just such this awesome thing i was like this is awesome yeah Yeah. and then from then on i just you know dove head first i i didn't i would you know get a cd listen to it 
look at the thank you list, see who they thanked, checked out those CDs. That's the way. And then that was it. It just kind of got into it because of my, my older brother. Yeah, so that was the first show for Gazi. Before that, you were listening to other types of music, but that was your first live experience. Yeah. So what grade were you in then? Do you remember? Well, the Fugazi show, I was in the fourth grade. Jeez and then, Christ. yeah. And I, I was lucky. My older brother, you know, it was like that right time where my brother was really, um, really responsible and yeah. he, he had amazing grades and he graduated a year early. And so he had his crap together, didn't drink, didn't smoke. Another yeah. big influence on me for not drinking and not smoking anything, yeah. being straight edge. So I was able to go to a lot of shows because, yeah. of, you know, my mom trusted him and trusted me. So I was able to go. And yeah. see a lot of cool things, you know. Yeah, and 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 it was it was awesome. Did you start? Did you start? Um, I mean, you're only in fourth grade. That's really young. So fast forward, I guess to middle school and high school, like like wanting to start a band and playing guitar and stuff like that. Yeah, middle school. Yeah, so I, I wanted to play when I heard Primus. Believe it or Sick. not, I wanted to play bass. Yeah. So around sixth grade, I started playing bass guitar. Okay. And then <clears throat> Primus was awesome. Oh yeah, like. Driver was a race car driver. <laughs> you hear that bass line. <laughs> do, 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 do. Um, you know, I was like, oh, I wanted to play bass. So I started playing bass and then <clears throat> I was played in a little band in my middle school. Okay. Metal band. We were called we were we were called Backscatter, which Sick. is when a grenade blows up. It's all the backscatter oh, that shit. shoots Shrap, out. Shrap, you know, it was shit, pretty yeah. metal. It's so metal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> we went to the skate shop and the guy uh that worked at the skate shop drew our logo. It was some cyber warrior with like a metal glove awesome and a machine gun it was awesome that was our band logo anyway so <laughs> i did that and then after a while i just kind of got bored with the bass i just wanted to play guitar yeah. and i think a big thing was that was dookie green day dookie okay when that record came out Sick i was record. like oh man like seeing billy joe play guitar all the stickers on his guitar it just seems so fun and yeah. that's when i started getting into songs because more than just like whether the riff was cool or not yeah, because I think there's a difference. You could be like a musician who's like, I really want to be the best at my guitar or the best at bass, and I was like, I just really want to. I want to be good at playing, but write cool songs. Yeah, I got in. That's when I started transitioning to being more of like <clears throat> loving bands for the song, and not so much whether it was like ripped or not. If that yeah. makes sense, you know. Yeah. So what grade? What grade was that? Green did that had to be like. Eighth grade, I guess. Ninth grade. Ninety four, maybe. I'm trying to hear they came out with that record was massive, it changed everything. 90, it was ninety four. Okay. Because I remember one of the most heartbreaking things I ever experienced <laughs> was Law Palooza ninety four okay. in Miami. Green Day was on that one on Law Palooza, and they were the first band. They were the, they opened every day on the main stage. That's crazy. So we got there really early to get in to get close to see them. Yeah. Billy Joe walks out on stage, <clears throat> and he's like. He's like, hey guys, uh, Mike was hurt yesterday or two days ago at Woodstock from the security guard to tackle them. He's in the hospital or whatever, broke his arm. I forget what he said. And he's like, so we can't play. Damn. But Billy Joe walked out, told everyone that, and then walked off. It's kind of cool he did that. But it sucked for me. I know. Like, that wait, sucks. went early. I was like, that sucks. to see them on that album cycle. Yeah. You never got to see him after that on the cycle? Not on Dookie. Yeah. No, I saw him later on Insomniac. So that was before the internet. We had to actually, instead of announcing, make an announcement, you had to go on stage and say how, I know. how weird is that? It's so crazy that he came there and did that. That you can't, like, oh. you couldn't do it any other way. So <clears throat> at this time, you're in school. So how are you doing in school? Yeah. And like, and what are your goals? And like, what's your favorite class? Like, wh what do you love about school and hate about school at this moment? Um, so I kind of figured out school. I think a big a big influence a big influence on me in school was Ferris Bueller. All right, awesome. Yeah, you massive movie head. We can talk about that. Yes. So Ferris Bueller's <laughs> Day Off um, encouraged me to work the system of school. Mm. So oh, like yeah, the scams he was doing. I, yeah. I feel like I worked the system. Like I would help teachers grade the papers, and they'd give me passes, and I'd just go to like mm. library and hang out. They call that brown nosing back in the day. Yeah. It's like putting your nose <laughs> in the butt at the butt. Yeah, like, whatever. It's <clears throat> no, it was more like I, I was good at school. Yeah. And I was so involved with everything. Teacher's pet. Uh, I guess teacher's pet, but it was more, I wouldn't say that because my technology teacher okay. loved punk and metal. That's how he bonded. So he, and so in technology, they had all like the soldering stuff and yeah. all that. So I would be able to be like, hey, I need to do work in technology. And then I'd get a pass and I'd just sit in technology for like two hours. That's awesome. And just hang out with the teacher and he'd play punk rock 
That is cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or even my my math teacher, Miss Mossop, who was this Jamaican woman. Awesome. <clears throat> I, I was terrible at math. Okay, me too. But I was, but somehow she'd be like, let me take her papers, go in the classroom next door, grade her papers, and then she'd give me C's all the way. Awesome. But the <laughs> thing is, I was so involved. <clears throat> I was very responsible, so I was so involved in things outside of school. Yeah. <clears throat> like I had a job, I worked at a movie theater, had the band, promote shows, do things like that, that there was like a level, I think, of maturity that the teachers respected in me. Yeah. So they're like, all right, like as long as you get most, you know, your work done and your whatever. We'll get you through this. Yeah. And that was it. It was cool. <laughs> but, but then I didn't graduate because New, yeah. New Fun Glory got a <clears throat> record deal with MCA okay. when I was a junior in high school. Holy shit. So that's 95? <clears throat> no, that was... When was it? No, later than that. Because I was supposed to graduate in 2000. Okay. So it would have been 99. Okay, that's when New Fun Glory started. We started in 97. Yeah, but there's but, Shy Lou before that. <clears throat> so when I went on tour with you, yeah, I was supposed to be a senior in high school. Holy shit. What year was that? 99. Holy shit. Or 2000. No, 2000. So that we left was my school, we never got a GED or nothing? Nothing. Damn. Graduated. Don't get with yourself, though. Thank you. Um, so, while wow, straight to tour. So, how, what were your parents thinking about that at the time? So, my mom told me later that before she let me leave, that she went into my school's guidance counselor and said, "Hey, you know, this is son got a record deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, <laughs> and all this stuff. And uh, you know, their their tour needs to extend through his senior year. What do you know? What do we do? And she's like, "Well, you know, if you don't let him do it." This opportunity, he's going to resent you for the rest of his life. And that's Just imagine if that didn't happen, man. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. And that we wouldn't be sitting here. Exactly. How many shows had New Found Glory played to, before he got that deal? Like, what, what have you guys done before then? Um, before the deal? MCA, yeah, yeah. I mean, we did four years of touring. Four years of touring, yeah. So four years. Um, we were on a local hardcore label called Eulogy. Yep. And then we ended up. Being on drive through, yep, and then drive through led to MCA, and before that was Shy Lude, though, correct? Yeah, Shy Lude. I did Shy Lude for a couple of years. Was that the first real band? Eighth and ninth, yeah, first first band. Yeah, and even when, <clears throat> so, excuse me, I'm gonna burp. Um, so Shy Lude was a local band that had a different singer. Yep, that was getting a deal with Revelation Records, and they were kicking out their current singer. Gotcha. I was playing bass. In a hardcore band, and at the show, I screamed in the microphone like, like a backup. Yeah, you got a good scream voice. Thanks, bud. Yeah. So I, they heard, and then Shy Lude heard me sing that backup, and, and we then, want that guy. Yeah, and then we're like, hey, you want to <laughs> sing in our band? But I was 15, and they didn't know how I was going to be able to go on tour. Oh, but then they're like, all right, we'll just do it anyway. And Revelation Records, we sent them a, a demo tape of me s screaming. Yeah. And then they ended up still putting out the seven inch. And uh, all so Shai Halud had a tour with a uh, Christian hardcore band that was awesome called Strong Arm. I heard that name, yep. One of my best friends at the time, who was a lot older than me, um, Mike Hurley, who actually passed away two years ago. Oh, wow. Rest in peace, Rest Mike in Hurley. Peace. He came over to my house and sat with my mom, and he signed legal guardianship. <laughs> Holy shit! Of me to be in the band with him. <clears throat> To, so that way, wow. that way, if I got sick or hurt on tour, the hospital, gotcha. he would be able to make legal. So he, he had guardian legal guardianship of me. That's and crazy. that's how I was able to go on the first tour. And wow. also because Strong Arm was a Christian band, we're playing a lot of churches. Wow. So I was able to go to mom. Hey, we're straight edge. We're playing churches. They're a Christian yeah. band. You know, it's just for the yeah, summer. So it was like kind of going away shit. to summer camp. Yeah. But it was just on tour. That's crazy. But what was even more crazy... <laughs> Is that the tour was seven shows. Okay. And we booked them ourselves. And when you're a kid and you're young and teenagers, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Yes. So our first, so we started in South Florida. Our first show was in Canton, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> you ready for the second show? Yeah. Second show was Seattle. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Third show, Vancouver. Holy shit. Uh, fourth show, Orange County. Wow. Fifth show, another LA show, and then oh, there was two Seattle shows, so that'd be fifth and sixth. Seventh show was Arizona, <laughs> and then home. So who booked that? You the, did? 
I don't so know. nobody looks up Mass Four geography, none of that shit. Yeah. So <laughs> Ohio, two shows Seattle, Vancouver, two Southern California, Arizona, home. And what year was it, that? Seven shows. It took us like four weeks. <laughs> we had no money. We were what you guys rolling? Did you have a van? Did you? Okay. So, van. No. Uh, Strong Arm had a van and a trailer. Shia Lude had a Grand Marquis, like a Lincoln Town Car. <laughs> Holy shit! With the guitars in the trunk. Wow, dude. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. But I remember going to. Ohio, I was so excited for the first show. Yeah. Oh, actually, it was Ohio and Cleveland. That was the other show. Okay. And you were here insane? Yeah. So at the time I was 15, the band we opened for in Cleveland was One Life Crew. Holy shit. So I pulled up to the grog shop, <clears throat> and we opened for One Life Crew, and there's all these skinheads at the show, and I was like, oh, my gosh. What am I doing? This is cr- That's crazy. <clears throat> and then a homeless guy out front wanted money, so I was like, hey, I'll buy you like food. Yeah, chicken wings, and then he got really <laughs> pissed at me and didn't want the. F- I bought him the food and he threw it out. He, oh, that he, sucks. he wanted money instead, and then oh. I realized that you just you gave him money. There were homeless people like that. It's always been weird. It's always weird. They're like, well, I want money. I don't want food. If it makes you feel any better, um, I had Kevin Seconds on in their first first tour in the eighties across the whole country was a station wagon, <laughs> and they said they rolled up to the show and that's, and Ian McKay is like, "Was that the show?" He goes, so you fuckers drove across country in that? I said, yeah, it's, it's my parents' station wagon. So you do what you got to do back then. Yeah, you know? it was fun. It was Spread all the about, message. heck yeah. Um, it was awesome. So your mom was, your mom <clears throat> seems, your mom and, and pops, rest in peace, very supportive of just music for you at a very young age. Yes. It's pretty amazing. That, yeah, it was awesome, man. Very supportive. Because you didn't know, at that point, when you leave school to do Shahilu, did you realize, okay, I'm going to be a musician? I doubt you thought, I'm going to be a musician the rest of my life, did you? I'm just doing this no. right, right now. I'm in this moment. Yeah, because New Found Glory was the side project. Yeah, that's You're fucking like, even crazy. When I would get on shows, so that's how New Found Glory got our hardcore following in the beginning was, okay. in lo- locally, hardcore bands were the most popular. Yeah. So we would get on hardcore shows. Oh, it's the guy from Shahilu, his new band. Yeah. And then, so we did that up the East Coast. So we yeah. would open for... You know, friends in Boston, friends yep. in Jersey, Connecticut, you yeah. know, anyone I knew from hardcore shows would put on from Shy Lude would let yeah. New Found Glory get on hardcore shows. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's how we did it. And we grew up going to hardcore shows. So our stage energy. 100%. Was of a hardcore band. So Shy Lude was the first like actual record you were on? Yeah. On Revelation. Yep. It's pretty sick. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty sick for a resume of being coming from Hardcore Heavy first <laughs> seven inch of Revelation. <laughs> it's awesome. So yeah, I mean to get to New Phone Glory, yeah, obviously you're a hardcore kid. You write a lot of songs. Were you writing songs in Shy Lude too? No. Okay. I just sang. I just So Matt, what made you want to start writing songs and when did that begin for you? New Phone Glory, obviously. Um, it started I had a <clears throat> um so my mom and my stepfather met because of me and my stepbrother. So my yeah, this is a story about Blake, <clears throat> which I really love this story. I yeah, want to tell know, the story. It's you, pretty amazing. Yeah, so Blake <laughs> Blake, uh, Blake Maloney is my stepbrother. We went to middle school together, and we both listened to punk and hardcore, and would go buy records and trade records, and we'd ride our bikes to school and stuff. His dad was single. My mom was single. We were best friends, and we'd be like, yo, what if our parents met and they got married? You know? Um, and now I look back, it's kind of weird to be like, yo, your dad should like hook up with my mom. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. But it worked. But it worked. We were like, yeah. yeah, they should meet. So I, you know, I walked my mom over to to Blake's house and I like hey, and I was like, Mom, go go knock on the door. Don't be scared. Wow. And and they met and they've been married ever since. That is amazing. You know, and, man. and so me and Blake became brothers. <laughs> That's crazy. You, yeah. You thought about that and actually happened. Yeah. And then we became brothers and we ended up living in the same house and he was a drummer. So wow, Blake dude. had drum set up and I would play because he, Blake, Blake loved Blink, like pre Blink 182 when yeah. they were just Blink. He had all the skate videos. He loved surfing. He loved okay. skating. So he loved like West Coast punk. Yeah. So, and I loved East Coast hardcore. Yep. So we would basically play in the living room and play fun punk songs together. Yeah. And wrote a couple riffs, and some of those riffs ended up being the first New Fun Glory songs gotcha. that me and Blake jammed together. Okay. Um, so that's kind of like how the thing started. It was because of me and, well, New Found, <clears throat> Jordan, Ian, and Jordan and Ian already knew each other. Okay. And they were already playing. And then they recruited my older brother, played baseball yeah. with Ian when Ian was a kid. It was yeah. all like growing up in this little suburb. Yeah. So that's how I got in the band, is they heard that I played punk rock with Blake. It's crazy. Yeah. All right. So 
to rewind a little bit too, you said that your brother didn't do drugs and do alcohol and stuff, so he inspired you yes. to be that way too. So that's before you even knew it, there was a name straight edge for it, right? It was just something that you just didn't do, right? Yeah. So I got to, it's funny because I, I guess I was so like, so tame that when I heard it, uh, oh, I'll tell you the full story. It's yes. pretty funny. Um, my father was an alcoholic. Okay. Awesome. Loving dad. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Marvin Frank Gilbert, hero, hero of mine. He was um, an alcoholic when I was young, you know, and he had a, a pool business and it destroyed the pool business. Obviously his marriage, it got pretty dark, you know? Yeah. Um, and then also in, in Kentucky, like my family, um, a lot of my relatives, like growing up were poor, you know, they, they, there was a lot of like alcoholism, a lot of things, a lot of different relatives. I mean, I have a, even on my mom's side, you know, Kentucky, you know, during that time, like fifties, sixties, you know, like it, it wasn't a, it was a poor state. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of hardworking people like working all day. Like my dad moved to Florida when he was 15. Well, didn't move full time, but went to Florida to live with a family member to build pools to send money back to his family oh, because wow. they were, he had nine siblings. Yeah. <clears throat> They're Gilbert, Gil, Gilbert's where there were 10 kids. Okay. So anyway, so I experienced that and it was like, a, I loved my family and I loved all my relatives, even the drinkers, but like sometimes it was frustrating to be around because totally. you didn't know if they were there or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, all right, did they, are they past that point? Of, yeah, mentally. Me, yeah. yeah, so it was tough. So that made me and my brother never want to drink from when we were little kids. Scared you straight. Pretty it much. Scared me straight, yeah. So, and and I love my dad and, and um, you know, all my relatives. It's just, you know, we all have our something about us where, you know, yeah. downsides. And that was just a thing at the time. Culturally, there was, I think, like really heavy in my family. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> anyway, so like, Years later, when I got into crazy music, I already didn't do drugs. Yeah. Um, my best friend at the time, Wes, uh, Wes, and du Wes and Dustin, they were brothers. They both, their older brother, Jordy, just got in Marilyn Manson. Holy shit. I mean, yeah, Jordy, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because they were, because he lived in Coral Springs. Okay. Right? So those guys, like, they, Marilyn Manson was from our little town. I didn't know that. So we were all, we would go to, when Manson was a local band, me, Wes and Dustin would always go to the shows Damn. and hang out. And, and they're pretty, Wes and Dustin were pretty crazy. Like Weston smoked and, and stuff like that and drank yeah. a little bit. And, uh, he had, we would skateboard around and he had my skateboard. Yeah. And he took uh, a rock and wrote a big X and an S E on it. Oh, shit. huge. Okay. Right. Scripted on there. Yeah. Huge. He wrote on it. I go, what are you doing? Why are you writing sex on my board? <laughs> <laughs> I go, don't write sex on my board. He goes, it's not sex. He's like, it's straight edge. That's you. That's what you are. And I go, what do you mean? He's like, he's like, you're like punk and you're crazy or whatever, but you like don't do drugs. He's like, that's what you are. You're straight edge. Mm. And I go, really? And then right there, I was like, whoa, I have a place. Yeah. At the it's time, a, it's a name for something I already am. Yeah. Yeah. Because at the time, okay. it was it was weird, you know, because. Me and all my friends, we'd go to the mall. We would terrorize mall security. Yeah. We would go around and like... Skate punks and Skate shit. punks, you yeah. know. Yeah, go to Dunkin' Donuts at midnight and steal the donuts. And <laughs> everyone's hanging out and, you know, s you know, people with Liberty Spikes, smoking, drinking, yeah. partying. But there I was with like my crazy clothes. My yep. But I was like, no way. I'm never doing that. Yeah. So they're like, that's what you are. So once I knew that, I was like, oh. They a, find, they I'm not it. alone here. Yeah. Like, it's okay to be like into punk rock and wild and I love that same thing to me but i was like why are you writing sex on my board <laughs> so maybe after that did you you couldn't go on the internet because no internet so you started thinking about when did you start finding straight edge well, bands or the music well, yeah then i heard um then i heard that fugazi's old band was minor, minor threat, threat. yeah which i didn't know that i already yeah. liked fugazi i was like what there's another so then i got to listen to minor threat and i was like yeah and then <laughs> <clears throat> i'll tell you the funniest thing is that no effects, white trash, two heaps and a bean came out, and mm -hmm. they cover straight edge. That's right, they do. But there's no internet, so shit. I thought that they were a punk band that were straight edge. <laughs> oh no, shit! <laughs> so it's like you know, totally I didn't opposite. Know. Yeah. yeah, totally opposite. But I was like, oh, they cover straight edge and to make it fun because they're punk and they like it. Yeah. So they must be straight edge. And they have X in their name too. Yeah. Holy and then later shit. I was like, oh yeah, not straight edge. <laughs> Damn. So did you start? Did you start getting into like? 
did you like find youth of today girl of biscuits earth crisis yeah, all that shit all that stuff you know it just kind of went that was a cool thing you know about record stores you know you would just go and i'd flip through the vinyl sections or the cd sections and i would just look at thank you lists yeah you know and and revelation oh who else is on revelation such a great catalog for those bands too yeah Oh, what shirt are they wearing? What is it, Bold? Or what's that band shirt? Exactly. Judge? Yeah. And that's what, honestly, later when, you know, if you look at old stuff with New Found Glory, we were like, oh, man, if we ever got on MTV, we want to do the same thing. Like, we want to wear all those shirts. That's why, yeah. like, our TRL video, I'm wearing a Bane shirt. Yeah, I remember you know, that. Or, or, like, any time, we're like, made sure whatever shirts we wear. And you guys did that, too. Oh, no, I remember Conan, when you guys were on Conan. Conan. Yeah. 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 Ball scar, yeah. Yeah, like, that was, like, the thing. You know, yeah. we, we wanted to take... Two props. We wanted to take what we saw bands doing records and, oh, if we're going to have this opportunity, we got to make sure yeah. to hook up everyone else. Yeah, my friends over you video. We, I was in there with, um, who else is in there with me? Travis and Skinhead Rob. Yeah, Tim. Tim. That was awesome. That was a really fun shoot. Yeah. And then uh, I know I sang back up on Sticks and Stones and the self-titled. Yeah. People always ask me, like, what song? I'm like, I'm not sure. I'm pretty much sure I sang gang, <laughs> pretty much sang gang vocals. Yeah, you sang gang vocals and you did a go. I did? Go! Okay. On one of them. Because I have those in my... Uh, yeah. Those, those are the, the, the my only Go Records I ever got in my entire life, but they're from other bands, but I have yours. That's awesome. <laughs> there. So when did we when did we meet? Because I, I, I remember you saying to me, oh, I like your hat. I had a Mad Ball hat on or something. I don't know if that was like Irving Plaza or Andrew Ellis brought me to your Irving Plaza show. You have to check out this band, New Found Glory. I'm trying to think of the first time as I met you. I know it had to be in New York, no? Well, uh, I met you as a fan. In Florida? Yeah. I opened up. Shy Lude opened up for H2O Murphy's Law. On the, on the 1996 at, tour. At the Edge in Fort Lauderdale. Beer and Water Tour. Holy shit, for real? Yep, we opened. I played <laughs> there. I played that show with you. I met you as a fan. Hey, man. Love you guys. Oh, shit. Psyched to play with you. Met you there. <clears throat> and I remember going back and just seeing all these New York people in the backstage and being like, oh, man, I got to get out of here. <laughs> because it was like folklore, you know? Yeah. New York folk, you know? Folk, yeah, it's true. Like, I mean, in, in live, it's real. Yeah. But still, you're like, oh, man. You know? That was in Florida too, huh? I heard that guy oh, rap on rip, ripped the too. ceiling down and smashed it over 10 police guys and then put a bomb in his car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're like, you know, like the trick, like Urban telestrations that keep, keeps yeah, going down Yeah, the story now. gets worse and worse as yeah, it so continues. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think Irving Plaza too, I met you again there, Met right? you then, yeah. And yeah. then I met you uh, again. I went and um, I actually worked Barricade for... Marky, uh, Marky Ramon, H2O Misfits. Oh, shit. And, at the theater in Pompano. Nice. Met you then. Yeah. And I like fanboyed. What's up, man? <laughs> yeah, but then, yeah, I don't know where we officially like, was it on Warp Tour or something? Probably I can't remember there. where we officially like. Sort of hanging and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Because definitely met you in New York, the Urban Plaza show. I came to that show. Yeah, did. Did and you said Andrew else yeah, might have yeah, brought well, you? Yeah, had me come down there. Yeah, that is awesome. I Thanks, had, Andrew. I had Mad Ball hat on, like nice hat. I remember that, and then seeing the show. Oh yeah, back. I remember the yeah, yeah. man. Or was it Bowery Ballroom? Yeah, one of those. Yeah, I remember meeting you in the side room. Yeah, you came back. That was so, awesome. So, where did the name New Found Glory come from? Oh man, New Found Glory uh, was like just an accident. We had there was this girl named Amy Fiddler. I know, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Fiddler Records. Yeah. Amy would put on local shows. She was a friend of mine and she got us, she booked us a show, but we had no name. Gotcha. So she called me and she's like, I need a name for the flyer. I need it by this day. And we're like, we don't have a name yet. We don't That's know. That's a lot of stories for a lot of bands, I think too. Yeah. You yeah. just, you, you don't know Wing what to put it, on yeah. it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, I went and, uh, oh, Jordan, my singer went to Barnes and Noble and just started flipping through things and started drawing, Jordan draws. So he was like drawing a flag and doing okay. all this stuff. The Get Up Kids had a song called New Found Interest in Massachusetts. Interesting. I knew and that. we really liked that song. Mm -hmm. um, and Jordan had New Found. Yeah. And then like something, something, Salt Glory and put New Found Glory. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. And I saw it in a book or something. And they're like, oh, cool. We'll put that on the flyer. We'll change it in like a couple months. Damn. Just put it on there and we'll change it. And then that was it. This is history. Yeah. And there was a New Found Glory in okay. the beginning. A, oh, a, there already was a band, or that's what you called it? That's what we were called, okay. A New Found Glory. That's right, you're right. But then fans started calling us NFG, and when Nothing Gold Can Stay got distribution, we would go to the mall to see our CD, and sometimes it was in the A section, and sometimes it was in the N section. Mm. So the label was like, hey guys, we got to get rid of that the A. That is confusing. So we took the A out back and killed it. So Now it's just an NFG. So before the first New Found Glory record came out, 
um, you guys had been touring and building a fan base and stuff. And um, that first, with the first release, the major was on the major, right? The first was the MCA, the first one, self titled. No, the first major, the the first, well, yeah, was drive self-titled was the first major label release. Yeah. Our first full length was on Eulogy. Okay, that's which right. Was okay. A, our first EP was on Fiddler, then our first full, full length was on Eulogy. Yeah. That's what we toured around, got on shows, and then once that sort of started taking off, got a buzz, yeah. drive through wanted to re-release it. Okay. So then that got re-released on drive through So when that started taking off, like... At that point, you play New Found Glory. Like this is what I want to do. Like, I'm, I'm I'm a musician, and we're playing these shows. And is that what you is that, is that how you saw your future at that point, even th- at that young age? Yeah, it was just kind of like <clears throat> didn't really know how far it would go. Yeah, the odds. <clears throat> it was kind of like one of those nothing, you know, nothing to lose sort of attitudes, where it was like, you know, we don't. All of our favorite bands are not big. Yeah, all of our favorite bands play 300 cap rooms and have the time of their lives. Yeah, exactly. So like. We just want to tour and play, and and that's it. So we kept touring and playing, and then the shows get bigger, and the shows get bigger, and just happened so you know gradually and and fast. We're like, oh my gosh, now, like, like time moves so fast. So you know, we were on tour for a long time. You know, there was a time we were like four years straight just touring, and the next thing you know, you're you know you're playing an amphitheater, you know, closing. It's crazy, and you're like, wait a second, what? Like this is insane. Yeah. Um, but because I think, I think a good thing, um, shout out to set your goals, but is to set your goals. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the, in, in the save record. Great. Yeah. Record. And the, oh yeah. Amazing <laughs> record. Um, a thing about it is, uh, you know, I think because we never our our dream was not to be in a famous band. Yeah. I think if you're, if whatever the heart of what you're doing is like, that's just, it, it's, it sets the rules. Yeah. You know, so because of our, our dream was never to be in a famous band. We don't lose any integrity and we're able to make our own in decisions yeah. because we're like, we don't do anything to be a famous band. Yeah. We do stuff that makes us feel right and love what we do. Yeah. So like when we were, uh, when we were playing amphitheaters, we weren't like, how do we make sure we always play amphitheaters? Yeah. We didn't think about that. We're like, we're going to play a good show yeah. and then record a new record. If our new record is sounds current, like what's on the radio, awesome. Yeah. If it doesn't, awesome. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing. Like we just kind of kept doing, you know, playing New Found Glory songs. And so we went from playing 300 cap rooms to amphitheaters to back to, you know, smaller rooms again. Yeah. And we love it. Yeah. You know, and, and because of that, like your fans are a part of the journey and they just like, you know, there's the, highs and the lows. Yeah, it's fun. You know, so so I think because we never intended to be that that popular when it happened, we were really really appreciate it, appreciative of it. Yeah, we weren't like we deserve this. Yeah, and then when it went away, we weren't like what the heck we took it away. Yeah, yeah, like what the heck? we weren't bitter. We're like cool. This is fun. We're still on tour. That was the still goal. doing what we love playing together, best friends, and yeah. And I, I say this all the time. Like, and I feel like you know, you and H two O do this too. You know, like you're, I don't feel like I'm in a, in the music business. I'm in the newfound glory business. Yeah, I agree. You know, you're in the H2O business. 100%. There's things you do that people will be like, why are you doing that? Yeah. There's things we do where we we're like, we get offers from stuff and we're like, we don't want to do that. I'm like, why? Too. I don't feel like going. Yeah. But this is a really great opportunity. And you're, money too. You're, like, I don't even care. Yeah. You don't even care. Your band's going to really, this. I'm like, man, like, I'm so happy with my band's at. Like, yeah. I'm just like. I'm not going to sacrifice, you know, um, anything because I feel like I need to be bigger or smaller or, or to prove something. Yeah. Or to prove something. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, lucky, but I think that's because at the start of something, it's important for people to go, okay, why am I doing this? You never really think about it. You don't. You just do stuff. You're in the moment, just doing it. Yeah. So like, you, I didn't see the future really. Yeah. So it's important to do that and hold on to it. Why am I doing this? And when things get shaky and weird and people start to question my you know and i start losing sight of who i am to remind yourself okay this is why i'm doing this yeah this is my goal and then if you stick at that then you know you kind of feel a little bit unstoppable you know yeah so you guys are like on indies and majors and the radio and television um like you said like the highs and lows of the industry so when 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 did you realize like holy shit like this is a career and this is and this is like 
something I'm doing full time because like you say, you just in the moment you're playing shows and they're going from 300 to like uh, sheds and arenas where you guys play. They remember some of those tours with you and uh, Good Charlie. That was fucking massive. The yeah. Honda Civic tour and all that stuff. But like, when did you realize like, holy shit, like this is, I'm pretty much a musician. This is what I'm doing. Um, was, there, was there a defining <clears throat> moment? Or like you said, you just kept playing and here you are still playing and just kept it going. Yeah, I don't think I've ever, I think it's still ke- keeping it going because yeah. <laughs> who knows, like two years, I might need to get a job. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, who, Were you ever worried? you never have know. You ever, have you ever, ever been worried about that? Or had, did you ever have a plan B? Um, well, producing, we'll get to that. But. So I think that's a thing. I think it's <clears> important <throat> to not think plan A, plan B, or plan C. I okay. think it's just all one plan. Which yeah, is one life, one plan. Yeah, one life, one life. Which is like, I will always play music, no matter what, no matter what, and I will always do what's best for my life. So yeah, if that's getting a job, I don't look at that as a different plan. Yeah, I look at it as it's life. It's what keeps me playing music. Yeah, totally. It's what keeps me responsible, happy, whatever it is. So it doesn't really. I I don't look at it. I don't divide it. I'm just it, at this point. It just all. Cause then it takes the stress off. Yeah. I don't have to worry about, you know, when, you know, I, th- I think the mentality of crossing that bridge when you get there, it's, 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 it's true. You, 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 uh, you know, you, I don't set any things. I yeah. don't, I don't look at any of it as, cause I feel like I've learned the most in life from the struggles. Yeah. So, I so if I, if there ever is a struggle, I just, I'm like, all right, like, what am I going to learn from that time? Yeah. You know? Like, oh, I got to get a job. Cool, I'll get a job. And then I'll be the manager at that job exactly. in a year. Whatever I'm yeah. going to do, I'm going to do full on. Yeah. And I won't look at it as winning or losing. Yeah. Just life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did you ever feel like quitting? Yes. The band? Heck yeah. yeah. Felt like quitting around radio surgery time. Okay. Um, yeah. And then personal- was burnt? Sh- burnt and then lost track of- myself yeah the, the creative the everything yeah and then i had you know there's some personal struggles and yep. i was like wow I'm, i feel really lucky and i don't have to you know my existence isn't just the band it's like learning your your value everywhere as a person and then you're able to just do the band and love it not yeah. not feel like it defines you i like that i like being in a position too where you, you can we're lucky to be in positions where we do other things also to survive and live this life. And then we get to play music for fun, still with our best friends. And it's not about the money. It's about having fun. And I feel like obviously the money's great and you get to make a living doing stuff you love. But when, when it's just, when it just becomes a job and like you're going through the motions on stage, that really sucks. And you can see that when bands are just doing that for the paycheck mm-hmm. and people and kids can see that they can, they can see through that. So they know you're doing it because for the love of the music, I, yeah. think, I think that's what cre- that that's kind of um, keeps your longevity as well. For sure, the people know you love what you're doing. You know. Well, I think before we started this podcast, uh, recording the podcast today, you said something to me like, oh, "I can't wait to go on tour." Yeah, it's been and five that, months. Yeah, and you know why? Because you love work. Yeah, and that's a thing. There's a common misconception we have when we're younger, and I feel like everyone goes, "I want to be in a band, and I want to get so big I don't have to work anymore." Yeah, it's, it's, that's a common thing yeah. I used to say that when I was a yeah, kid like, it's not real um, life though yeah. it's not real life because yeah. you know what happens you know us being human beings happens where we then don't have a job and we go damn I want to work Yeah, I want to do something Yeah, because we want to do as people we like doing something and stay busy yeah we like staying busy and what happens to people that get really really successful is they can't work and they can't do whatever and then they you know become hermits and they become drug addicts yeah they get involved and they're not happy yeah idle hands you know yeah devil's playground that's what they yeah. say right because you're like oh what do i do now and and what fills in that space the void uh, that yeah what fills in that void are bad things that's when things slip mm-hmm. in there you get in trouble and and i think that that's what's so cool about working is like when i'm not on tour i love doing stuff when, yeah when you're not on tour you're doing a podcast yeah because when you're able to stay busy, yeah. yeah, you're contributing, you're you know expressing what I mean? myself in a different way, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. And you're working and you're contributing to to something else where yeah. people, other people, can enjoy it, yeah. And you're like, you're making things like pr- Being grow, creative and grow, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, you had the what's eating great, what's eating uh, Gilbert side project. You had the movie website, yeah. Um, the bre- the breakfast, yeah. the breakfast you're doing. You've always stayed busy and always been connected to movies. 
Um, has that been a big inspiration to you as far as writing as well? It's kind of a weird question because you, you're not writing songs based off movies, but maybe you have been inspired by movies that you write songs. Yeah, for sure. 100%. There's There's been like, yeah, like I, th- I feel like growing up in the 80s when I was sick from school, my mom would take me to the VHS video store and you'd rent a bunch of VHS. Before Blockbuster, yeah. Yeah, before Blockbuster, exactly. Yeah. And all those movies and that stuff would just, you know, whether the, the love or the sto- the heartache, all, whatever yeah. it is, all like, you know, gets into your subconscious. You 100%. Know? So, I th- yeah, I think writing songs is definitely like stories of, you know, that, that come out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. I know. Uh, we had love the movie movies. crew out here too, movie gang. I movie look, gang. We used to roll deep to the movies out here so much, man. Opening nights, Dude. huge. I love, like I love that. I love the energy. People. I would never stop going to the movies, even if people like download them and do all that shit. I like going there. I like getting the popcorn and yeah, it's, and it's a cool. Rele- you keep it's, that alive, you know. It's a release. Yeah, it's a relief. You you go. You have a stressful day. I go to the movies all my time, even by myself. On tour, they're the best days yeah, off. Yeah, just sit there. Um, tell us about the stuff you do in. in uh, and um franklin franklin yeah franklin i live in franklin tennessee and there's the movie this stuff awesome. yeah man, yeah there's this old movie theater um that was ref, you know was it refurbished re- redone rebuilt no refurbished is what you do to like a yeah. couch right <laughs> i don't even know yeah um, not refurbished but that's my my ged my non-ged <laughs> talking <laughs> <laughs> I say a lot of words. I just don't really know what they mean, but they just okay. sound like they it, sound like they work. Yeah, they sound big. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a it was a, a, a old theater that was saved, like originally, you know, like yeah. from the 30s or 40s, and they redid it and it's, they renovated it's, it. Renovate. Yeah. <laughs> they refurbished. I graduated. They re- okay, renovated it. <laughs> they refurbished it. <laughs> <laughs> they re- yeah, it was awesome. Um, it's a really beautiful place, but. So Franklin, um, they showed a lot of older movies yeah. and they do a lot of concerts that are like to an older crowd. Okay. But there's a very big younger demographic of creatives in Franklin For sure. and around Nashville. So I went to the theater and I said, look, so this is a great venue. I said, there's a lot of cool things going on at movie houses and other cities. Yeah. And I said, I would like to do something like that here. Would you let me try it? Here's my idea. I want to go to... Local coffee shops, food store, like food shops, cool businesses, and have them co-promote, and we'll do cool giveaways for awesome. movies. And they're like, I'm like, I'd love to try one. Support the neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah, support, support the community. community. And I said, I'd love to try one. And the theater goes, you can't try one because if you do one, you don't, you can't tell if it worked or not. So you should do four. Nice. And I was like, good. I, that's smart. Yeah, because yeah, you really wouldn't be able to tell. It's like the ultimate DIY too. I love it, man. Yeah. So I did one, and it sold out a month in advance. Fucking awesome! I Jack. did Home Alone at Christmas. It's the place holds uh, about three hundred people. So I hired a Santa Claus. We had an ugly sweater contest. We gave out candy canes. So we amazing, did contests yeah. all around Home Alone. Decorate the theater. I project images. Um, some movies, if they're like <clears throat> big action scenes, since Franklin Theater is also a concert venue, I program lights. So you'll be watching the movie. And then all of a sudden, like explosions coming in, like yeah, flashing your eyes, flashing and stuff. Like awesome. When I did Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the famous like heart rip out scene, I had the sconces and the lights look like fire. So it was yeah. like the whole theater was red and you see awesome. like Kalima ripping out <laughs> Indiana Jones heart. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there. And the, the coolest thing about it is that it's not really even because of newfound glory. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. all parents yeah. and their children, and I'm just like this random movie guy. There's like the different life, though. Like you're on yeah. tour, you're back home, you're doing stuff in your community. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So they just show up, and they're like, what movie's next? You know, they got their... It's cool. It's like a little... It's This Christmas will be my fifth year. It's awesome, man. Can you believe it? Five years. It's pretty amazing. And you just do it out of your passion and love for movies and theater and cinema and all that stuff. It's Yeah. It's amazing. It, yep. Um, it's fun. We just did Big Big Trouble in Little China. <clears throat> we did uh, Big Trouble in Little China. Was it last Friday night? And I hired, oh, yeah, yeah. I hired a, a karate school. You serious? So, yeah, I had a guy on. Before the movie started, I had the school on stage, and they were breaking boards and use nunchucks. That's <laughs> and, amazing. Like, it was so funny. So you got to see this like <laughs> live martial arts thing and then watch Big Trouble in Little China. Are you watching that Karate Kid thing on YouTube channel? I haven't, but I hear it's awesome. Yeah, Adam Blake's addicted to it. I forgot what it's called, though. Adam Blake. Um, What's up with him? He's he's a trainer, man. He's, I know. He's, he's yoked. He's 46. He looks great. He does. Um, I have more thing. I got more things here. So you've always been 
like a proud like a proud flag carry of pop punk and you're proud to play pop punk and yeah. you know as much as you're a hardcore kid you're also involved in this music and you have the I love when you guys made like the pop punk's not dead shirt and the tour yeah. and the whole thing around it <clears throat> um, why is that so important to you and I feel like you guys are still one of the main pop punk bands that like have that pride and still play that type of music um, and who created it you think Where'd that come? I mean I know obviously like the pop your punk blink Green Day, Offspring, all those bands in the early '90s, but this era, this no, era, nobody, nobody called that, called that name, and you kind of like you embraced it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. I think <clears throat> what happened with us, um, you know, it, I feel like our, I guess our brand, I, you know, we created our brand or yeah. our style of yeah. pop punk because <clears throat> we were such a weird group of people where Jordan loved you know, the indie revelation side. Yeah. You know, like, like the Texas sense, reason. sense field, Texas yeah. reason, you know, then he loved get up kids and like more of the promise ring respect. You know, he liked the emo, the emo side side stuff. Yeah. Ian was all West coast punk lag wagon. No use for a name. Unwritten law. No effects. Britney Spears. Like, Britney Spears. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. West coast punk. Um, <laughs> Uh, Cyrus was more of like the radio rock guy. He right. loved big records, like alternative stuff like cool. that. And I loved back. New York hardcore. Mm -hmm. And I loved, I loved like Rancid, yeah. Green Day. I loved punk too. But at the time, I was like heavy into that. So New York hardcore has the rhythm. Yes. H two O. You know. You know. You know, and melody, show, yeah, and melody. So, but I love the gr <clears throat> the groove, the head bobbing groove, and then the punk. So, what we did was, and then the emo lyrics. So we combined it. So we, you know, we would have. You guys have hard break. You guys have like breakdowns, like breakdowns. Pit, mosh, yeah. yeah, and the difference yeah. is, is I move it to the major key. Hardcore is in the minor key. Got or you. in darker, darker chords. Okay. So that's what we did. We're like, I want to do New York hardcore. I want to do punk. I want to let's combine it all. And I that's like that. how Newfound Glory was made. So we'd go on tour and have these like da, 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 these like, you know, set it off rhythms. Yeah. <clears throat> with a big sing along. It's true. Actually. And it just worked. True. So people never heard it. And the thing that's funny is and when we first got so we always did hardcore tours, but when we first got on the punk tours, it was not embraced. I remember we opened up You were for, hard to be on those shows. Yeah. Or, or just like I remember opening up for Real Big Fish. Oh shit! And doing a tour with them, and like people throw change at us. Wow! L opening up for Less and Jake, people throw. You know, You're like the, a the hardcore first band ones. on those bills. Yeah, we're or they just didn't even know what it was. Yeah, the fans. It was too new. Yeah, it was too new. Like the, our style of pop punk yeah. would be fast, but then we were like yeah, in breakdowns. shorts, and you know have highlights in yeah, our hair. Yeah. You know, like yeah. who are these dudes? You know, it's true. So then, yeah. So then it grew and evolved from there, and I think. Um, I think one reason that I definitely am embrace it is I think, you know, that, you know, our fans called us that, you know, yeah. they, you know, where we always tour the hardcore, hardcore bands. We came, we came up with on our shirts. We came up with easy core. I love that. That was our joke. I remember that. Yeah. We started it. We called it Coral Springs easy core because we weren't a hardcore band yeah. and we weren't a punk band. Yeah. We we're like, we're easy core, you yeah. know, at the time. And then once we started touring with Blink and Face to Face and more punk bands, that's where the pop punk thing really started growing, and gotcha. we and we embraced the name because I feel like if you you can go along with your fans and enjoy it together, or you can fight them. And what's the point in fighting your fans? So why are we going to go? We're not a pop punk band. We're this. Like yeah. who cares? And whatever. As long as they're listening to you, call us whatever you want. Yeah. As long as you like us, call us whatever you want. Exactly. So then we started embracing it, and it's really fun, you know. And I think a big reason why, excuse me. I love it is, and I think H2O is one of these too, is I love being a gateway band. Yes. I think that's- Positive gateway drug to it, other music. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's how you stick around forever. Yeah. Where you might not be someone's favorite band of all time, but it's cool to be the band that gets someone to their favorite band. Yeah. Like where you, I'd rather be that. I'd like rather that. be the consistent band- that, oh, I got a new Found Glory, and then I heard about all these other bands. I like that. And that's what happened with us. Just from a shirt you're wearing, too, whatever, on stage. Yeah, yeah. and that's really cool. So you can, you, you know, there's always a place for new Found Glory because yeah. we're our own thing where 
you get into us, you learn about all these other things. You you can be a hardcore kid and like New Fun Glory. You can be yep. a football player like New Fun Glory. Yep. You can be, you know, uh, an alternative girl and like New Fun Glory. Yeah. You know, you can be a punk kid. It doesn't matter. It's yeah. like we're this thing where everyone kind of belongs and you can branch out in your own direction, but Love it all that. starts back at Newfound, Newfound yeah. Glory. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's cool. I like so I embrace it and I'm like it's fun, you know. Get pl- I love that because before, like, people would be like, "Oh, H2O, you guys sound pop punk. Oh, you're not hardcore because hardcore is supposed to sound like this." Like, people think there's a certain sound for every. Like, hardcore is supposed to sound one way, and pop punk supposed to sound the other way. I mean, I always call ourselves New York handsome hardcore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pe- when we came out, we were melodic and on our seven inch. And but the way I looked and who I hung out with, people expect to be to be like more aggressive, but we weren't. But yeah, I mean, I feel like there's real no true sound of any kind of genre i think it's everything combined like you said like take the best of these inspirations yeah and, there's definitely things in h2o that are more punk driven and there's yeah. things that are more hardcore driven yeah and, and rock driven even other parts you know yeah and i think the cool thing about h2o i remember hearing h2o um i got the seven inch and then when i got the first full length i was like oh my gosh i felt like h2o was like my dream come true thank you man you know what i mean it was like Wow, what if there was punk and hardcore? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mixed together, yeah. Yeah, and hardcore that's that, punk for real. And that yeah. when that record came out, I was like, oh man, you guys and the fun live shows. It yeah. just was like, you know, it it was it was awesome. And I remember getting that record and being like, no way. And I remember my older brother met you guys first. Okay, outside of Bogarts, I have photos. Since he's a Bogarts, great venue to play, man. Yeah, because the since he's yeah he, he lived in Lexington for school, for okay. Kentucky. Yeah, and we drive to Bogarts, and I have a photo of my brother in front of your H two O school bus. Oh shit! Right, yeah, the thing the that said, the mini bus said H two O. It's my brother. Wow. and all you guys, and he took he, someone. Oh, took I love it to on see that. I like to get yeah. that. That's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll have him. I'll our, text him. See if he can send me a picture. Our baby blue bus. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was like, you know, you know, he, he met you guys as a fan. That's and, awesome. And I mean, I even remember all my friends loving, you know, one of the reasons you won over our scene so much in South Florida was when the Boston show sold out and you opened so up the back went, door yeah, and you let in Alex. That's right. I don't know if you knew that it was Street Alex. Street Justice, yeah. Coma. All I, my I, old friends. Wow. You, you let them all into the show for free. That's awesome. And then they were all, you know, and they going set it off, off in there. They set it off. <laughs> So, yeah, it was like, you know, I love that. long history. Another thing I think, too, that be, for both our longevities, obviously, is that we weren't afraid to play the Warp Tour. We weren't afraid to play with different bands. I think a lot of bands just sometimes just preach to the converted and they don't, they're too scared to, like, play with a different band. Like, we played with so many different, you guys and Trio and Sum 41, The Used and um, Boxcar Racer, and just going out in front of those audiences who don't know nothing about you and that challenge to win them over. And I think... That's what kind of meshed and helped with the different people hearing H2O. I was playing with you guys and stuff like that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I don't know why, ba- you know, I was thinking about this. I think some people forget. It's easy to forget that like everything has been done before. Yeah. When you take nothing's yourself, original, really, nothing's yeah. original. You take yourself so seriously. You're like, no, I'm not doing this. You know how many bands have already said, I'm not doing this before yeah. you? <laughs> like you're true. not doing anything new. Yeah. Like you think you're being creative and new and like yeah. revolutionary. No, that's art. Right. Like to me, it's like, don't let, don't let anything just dis- make your decisions for you. Do yeah. what's smart. Yeah. Like do what's smart. Do what's like good for people do what's like caring yeah and I, and then you know and but stay true to your you know yeah and so it's so it's like there's all these things i was like oh, i'm not doing that it's corny like what are you talking people about People put too many rules around themselves and too many too, yeah, yeah and they forget you're playing music yeah let's think about the concept of music it's sound mm-hmm. sound is to be heard yeah <laughs> it's true not like oh i'm gonna create something and then then decide who hears it once you create something it's in the it's it exists. Yeah, man. You're cr- if you don't want to be a part of anything, don't create music. Yeah. Don't That's be a in a point. band. What's the point? Yeah. It's so weird to think about like, oh, I'm going to write music which is for other people like and then if you're like it's not for other people, it's for me. Well, then you are a freaking cocky like yeah. why are you sitting you just want to hear yourself that's such an ego like, yeah. oh, I'm going to create my own music to listen to myself. Yeah, that's weird. I can't listen can you listen to your own music. Sometimes, yeah. I could like if I'm like um like my girlfriend, like she's like, oh, I want to hear this record. I'm like, oh, yeah. listen to this. Yeah. And you talk about the songs. Oh, I wrote wrote this 
riff because of this. I was yeah. inspired by this. I think I can listen to it with someone else more for like a fun evaluating. Yeah. Maybe that po- point of time. Yeah. I take Lyft a lot around and sometimes they'll say, what do you do? What are you doing? I'm in a band. What's your band car? I'm like, oh God, here it goes. Yeah. Like hardcore punk band H2O. Then, they, oh, let me check it out. And then the driver will put your music on in the car. <laughs> and I, I, last week I was like, excuse me, can you not do that? It's, I feel weird. Like I'm, I don't play myself. Look, look, look me up after that. It's just weird hearing yourself. <laughs> it is. Um, but it's like hearing yourself on, on a voicemail. Oh, you hear yeah. your own voice. Like, That's what I sound like. Yeah, uh, it's weird. Um, another thing I, that I want to say about you is that you have a really, we got to work with you. We were the first band you produced was Nothing to Prove in 2008. That was our first record in seven years after we had MCA with you guys. And um, Thanks, bud. Yeah, we took a chance and we went with Chad and you know, you, you we knew that you were going to bring out what you loved about H2O and it was your first time producing. We trust you because you did such a great songwriter and we got to go in the studio in Paul Minor and that was a great experience. I mean, you were living here. We live in the house together and driving back and forth. Work awesome. on the lyrics in the car, and um, yeah. So that experience, nothing to prove. What what inspired you to start producing bands, and why was it us? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, you we worked together on Hazen Street. Oh, we have to get to that too. Shit, yeah. So when when Toby and I worked together on Hazen Street, let's get let's go back to Hazen Street first. Okay, Hazen Street. Me and Chess started talking about doing a project together. I don't know how it even started. How they even start? I wouldn't. I don't know. I, I just we talked about. Yeah, just doing a band together, and, and yeah. at the time, I wanted it to be a little bit more heavier. Yeah, and I think you know you were you're so inspired by all different types. Yeah, at the time, I think you wanted to do something more like, like um, I don't know, just more like pop, hip hop influence, doing something different yeah. than you were already doing. And you do something melodic, and so Mad wanted to do something more melodic. Poppy. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> so we kind of all met in the middle, yeah. which was like, all right, I'm gonna do some riffs that are a little bit more aggressive than Newfound Glory, and yeah. then. So it worked out perfectly because it was like a little bit more poppier on some elements for you and I. Yeah. Or definitely for Madball. Totally. And then a little bit heavier for me and you. Yeah. From H2O. Yeah. So it was kind of all met in the middle and it be, just became Hazen Street. Yeah. And I remember like we had, so we got Dave Kennedy who was in uh, uh, Over My Dead Body. Yep. Oh, and, and also Box Racer. And then Freddie and Mackie from the Chrome Mags, Bad Brains, Fun Loving Criminals, and Hoyer Rock from Madball. I remember we all met at Swing House in LA working on the demos. Yep. And Chad had these crazy riffs. Like, I don't know if you haven't heard the record or heard the record. Some of the riffs on there are so poppy and so, like, even <laughs> oh, poppy for no, Chad. No, 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 no. Yeah, like some of these riffs. And we're like, what are we going to do with these? And we really didn't have, like, a major goal of the sound of Hazen Street. But then when the songs and the lyrics were so, like, opposite to the sound of the music, like, super hard, aggressive lyrics with the super poppy melodies. It was crazy. Just, and I'm even horror, like hearing the first time we do hear and hearing the harmonies or like the vocal patterns or like the melodies you had for like maybe fool the world. Like what the fuck? <laughs> and it just came out. Like I'm, I love that record so much. It's like one of the proudest things I've ever worked on with the people I worked on it with. And it was such a fun experience, you know, it was so awesome. I got a comment yesterday on our, on our new record, the new newfound. Someone commented, love you guys. When's the new Hazel street? <laughs> <laughs> Hazel. Hazel Street. I love it. That should it. be the next next EP. I love um, it. But that record was shit no. over ten years ago. It's yeah, crazy. people talk about it all the time. People come up to me, love friends, send me screenshots of them, like listen to Hazel Street. Yeah, like people really. It was special, man. It was funny because me and Freddie talked about it on the podcast already. It's like it, it got it got love and also got hardcore. Even Freddie's like, yo, even the hardcore kids kind of hated on it first but then years later people love and embrace it and freddie's like maybe because we didn't blow up maybe because it didn't do good and we got to keep it in the hardcore world but if it did it had blow up it would might have been a different reaction but those songs i'm just yeah. some really serious songs on there man like great songs yeah it, it what's cool is yeah it, it's the fact that we had no musical direction yeah, and it really was a piece of everybody. Yeah, and they just all like even like you know Mackie and what he added to the drums and Dude. the beats and you know and and everything you know like it, it just all was it was cool it was so fun man it was really fun to make and H- Hazen Street's named after the street uh, where Rikers Island is on for those listening you can you can Google that uh, but making that record and then fuck we had a so demo I, right yeah but I, th- well, I was gonna say I think from Hazen Street is where you. Working together on that, you're like, hey, do you want to do H2O? Exactly. We got inspired. Got, yeah. And and I think I was really excited and thank you for the opportunity because, again, like I, you know, I loved H2O. Yeah. Still love H2O. Yeah. And 
and I felt like, yeah, I felt like I could be able to push you guys because we were friends. Yeah. I'd be able to say something musically in a direction that was like loving, not in a way where you'd be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, where I'd be like, Hey, you know how you did this on this song? This is what was so awesome about that. You picked the best of H2O and yeah, that was like the goal moments and, and where you guys already had the material. Yeah. Cause you already have your H2O. Yeah. It was just like, you know, just like kind of telling you what you had, which one made me as a fan really psyched. Yeah. You know, and I think that's important is looking at it as like from the fan perspective. Yeah. And then that record ended up getting me, you know, I ended up producing, uh, well, I have the list, uh, uh data, re- <laughs> data, remember two of their records, which is fucking crazy. Actually three, three of the records, Terra trapped under ice, set your goals, fucking Lisa Loeb. Yes. There's more on your list, but I mean, Data Remember yeah. Data is pretty fucking big. Yeah, man. I did three Data Remember records, and, and the first time they hit me up, they were New Found Glory fans. Um, they're like, we love New Found Glory, and we love what you did on the new H2O. That's awesome. And that that was a good resume. Yeah, it was awesome. You know, And that and same thing, Terror. You know, it was like, hey, we love what you did with the H2O. And then Trapped on Rights, we love what you did with Terror and H2O. Damn. You know, it kind of always down, like, yeah. kind of trickled down. And I still got a call um, recently, friend Walter from Rotting Out. Same awesome. thing. Love, love the terror record. I don't know. Yeah. We're trying to work out schedules, but that would be, you know, yeah. Like I still get calls from people that really loved what, what we did. Yeah. On the, I mean, on the I record. mean, that was the best combo of like going on bridge nine after seven years, going back to an independent. Luckily we get off MCA cause it kind of crumbled. We kind of get set free and then doing that record with you. Um, there's actually talk about, our anniversary for the Go record. I mean, I'm going to say this live, but I never said this ever to you yet. I've told him the whole band that we actually want Chad to reproduce our Go record for the 20th anniversary that came out in 2001 because I feel like those songs stand up awesome live, but the production for me personally, no disrespect to Matt Wallace, I love you, was too polished and candy coated for me. And I feel like if we did those songs with you, Chad, would you be down add for some, that? Add some aggression. Would you to be it? down to re? Yeah, that'd be fun. Add do, some aggression to it. Yeah, just do it the way you did every other record. Yeah. Do the Go record. I feel like it could be a different life to it, you know? Would you add a new song? I don't know about that, but... <laughs> All right, so my wife just came into the room. Hello! Um, we're still, we're still, we're still, we're still, Mom, we're still going, yesterday? though, babe. What's up? Were you surprised yesterday? I was so surprised. Hey, you went to the pot. We're still having a great podcast. I was still, so excited. Chill, we're still talking. Um... <laughs> So yeah, so special guest. So I, Moon also, Morris. also for the fans, it was really confusing back then because it was before the internet. Can you kind of break down in a nutshell why you weren't allowed to be listed on the Hazen Street record? Because that was really confusing. Because we have these dope promo pictures that Lisa Johnson took hanging in my office. Yeah, and then when the new promo picture came out, you weren't in it. Well, you it guys was did, You guys didn't pay me enough. True. Okay. Well, <laughs> <it was all laughs> you know, no. Um. So. I don't even know if you remember the full story. Because I, I, I want to do with the label and shit, new well, record coming out. Even before that. So okay. I want to trickle back. Okay, trickle back. Trickle back. So MCA had an A&R guy, rest in peace, who signed you. Gary Ashley. Gary Ashley. Rest he passed peace, away. Gary rest Ashley. in peace, Gary. Awesome, dude. He signed us. Gary Ashley really believed in me and was going to sign bands with like me and help him. You can help. Find. I was finding bands, like an so A&R store. Sorry. I wanted to sign Piebald. Okay, he went and saw them. I wanted to sign Juliana Theory, who ended up signing to another major, and then there was a couple others, and then I wanted to do Hazen Street. Gotcha. So Gary Ashley paid, and MCA paid for us to do Hazen Street. I don't okay. know if you remember that. Do not remember the this. first demo the before first de- we had Mackie. That's right, the first demo that we got. Gary Ashley else. would come in and see us. Oh shit! Okay. Gary Ashley paid for the demo. Wow. Okay. We recorded those first two songs for MCA. Fuck. We were under MCA. This is history right here. Okay. We were. That was it. We okay. were gonna do. We were under MCA. Because you're already under there. You already signed. To I him. was already signed to MCA, so we were all good. And and you had H two O. It right. was like hans hans hey mm-hmm. so we were gonna hazen street was for mca those wow. demos were for them then mca folded yeah mca got dropped yeah so we then fell on a plate of projects that weren't finished yeah okay. i also had a bjork cover album sick that's i right. had like six covers of punk bands doing bjork songs that's sick so we had all this stuff moon's favorite i had yeah. all these projects on the table okay and then they all Went away, went away because um, Jordan Schur, who ran Geffen, That's right. came and took and decided what he wanted to keep and what he didn't. So okay. so then Geffen took over. Yes. 
Hazen Street was one of those projects that went away. We had the demo. We played it for other people. Shopped it around. Right? I was able to tell Geffen, hey, I already had this project going. This was approved before you came around. So they're like, look, you can still... Because they could have actually been worse. They could have yeah. at, wanted claiming on it, whatever. They're like, look, we're not going to put it out, but you're already... If you want to do this, you can finish the recording. Yeah. You can do whatever, blah, 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 blah. But you just... Cat, I was also doing Catalyst at the time, gotcha. New Glory Catalyst. They're like, we don't want you promoting two albums. I you gotcha. can only okay. promote New Fun Glory. Damn. You can only be in New Fun Glory. Yeah. And, like, this is, and, and that kind of say, did a couple things. So even though it sucked for me, because dude, you know, like I worked hard on that record. Fuck it yeah, sucks for me. Not, part of it. Yeah. it sucks for me not having my picture in it. Because yeah. it's like, it was great know, pictures too. Yeah. People getting props for a record. I'm like, and, uh, not in it. That you know? That bummed us out. But what saved the Hazel Street record is the fact that I was willing that I was, that I did that. It, the record was able to come out. Yeah. Cause Thank if you. I would have fought it, then they would have done, Oh, we want this on this. We this want great information. Percentage. We want rights. We want yeah. this. They could have gotten involved. So that's what, that was my compromise. Like you can't have your picture on it. You can say that you guitars performed by it, yeah. but you can't blah, blah, blah. And you played some live shows with us too. Played some live shows. Yeah. Yep. So that, and, so we had that demo. We shopped it around kind of, we just played it for people. So how was that? What was that process again? I, mean, I can tell it that, but I know we gave it to Benji and Joel. They heard it or something, or yeah, I think they heard those demos and just liked it. Yeah, just wanted to put it out. That's Scott Vogel's favorite demo ever. I don't want to say ever because I know it's some New York hardcore classic, but Vogel loves that. And um, I haven't even heard the demo. Yeah, ever. I was thinking about maybe. Oh, either, either I was, I was going to talk to you and Freddie about having the demo at the end of our podcast or Freddie's just the end. People can hear it. They can't get it, but this is on there. It's kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, play it. Um, that was really fun to make and doing that process and those tours, going to Japan with you guys, dude. Yeah. Fucking, we had the craziest tours in one year. Oh, man. I remember <laughs> at, at night we would go to Big Echo, the karaoke, and it would be me and Moon, That's right. Freddie, Lisa. Too. You you would go to some of them too. I get so tired. Yeah. I know, and just Freddie and Moon doing karaoke. <laughs> it, it was, was a great awesome. tour, man. Yeah. That was a great tour. I mean, the memories of Hazen Street were amazing. And then working with Homeboy with the sweatpants. Um, <laughs> uh, who was the guy? That did Howard the Benson. Howard Benson, dude. We got the massive producer on Epic Records. He would never show up. Oh, dude. <laughs> He'd show up with some milk and cookies and record yeah, your, and they'd pick his your vocals. A lot, I'm sorry, man. He did pick his burgers a lot. Um, but that experience I mean, was who just, doesn't? True. But not not right now, though. Yeah. Um, but the experience was great. The recording of Mackie and just just everything about that record was phenomenal. And then and then also the Nothing to Prove, working on the lyrics in the car. And Chad just be like, hey, what, what pisses you off? Or what's on your mind? And I just write down things. And then you can help me take all my mess and make it fit and make it organized you're really great with that and I, I appreciate that and just getting all my thoughts on paper then putting in the songs and and then like sending skiba the fucking bridge to fucking what happened and then sending that back and like yeah that was holy shit yeah dude. he sounded awesome i remember we got that dude. and even even uh pete when he did the not pete, oh, lou. lou lou yeah yeah lou when he the did friends the and oh the, yeah and the what happened part yeah yeah that was there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff man and it was just random it was just happened just in the moment, Paul Miner was great. You guys working together. Yep, Paul killed it. Studio. Um, and then also, okay, so after that, obviously, you guys are still touring. Hazen Street's happening. Then Madball gets back together. Um, and I want to fast forward to 2010. You had a, a health scare issue um, yes. with the thyroid stuff. that I think it, sucked. it was a really scary time for you. And uh, I remember you going through that. Um, and you had surgery on your throat? Or? Yeah, my thyroid. I... I um, I got like bronchitis or pneumonia or something. And when I went in, oh yeah, the doctor was like, I think you have pneumonia and felt my neck. And he's like, also, I f he's like, you have pneumonia and I think you have a uh, something in your thyroid. Go right now and check your thyroid. <laughs> right now. Yeah. And I went and he's like, yes, you have a tumor in the thyroid. You must see this person tomorrow. And he's like, oh, and you have pneumonia. So I went in and yeah, I had a tumor. And it was uh, inconclusive, which means that it could be cancer yeah. or it could not be cancer. Yeah. The only way to know is by cutting it out. So I had to wait till my sickness went went past because you can't get surgery when you're sick. Yeah. But basically, I found out on a Tuesday and I had surgery the next Thursday. And one I week. remember that was scary as fuck, man. It was really scary, man. It was. It. I think the scariest thing too was I didn't know until I woke up. 
So, yeah. so uh, I remember the first thing I was all loopy on on drugs. Um, up, edge watch, edge, edge watch. watch. <laughs> I was all loopy in the hospital on drugs, and I woke up and I remember going, "Do I have cancer?" And they're like, "No." And I was like, "I just gave a thumbs up," and I went back to sleep. Yeah, they open you up, so they basically they they come on the mic, please. You're gonna say something. Yeah, what Moon said was, "Did they open you up right there?" That's <laughs> that's what Moon said, and um, and yeah, so they did. They they basically they. While you're under, they remove the tumor, have a uh, lab person come in, they look at it, yeah. they check it out, and they and if if it's bad, then they cut out at m- the whole thyroid and your lymph nodes, and then if it's fine, then they just sew you back up. Okay. Well, they put it they put it like a dollar they put like a hundred dollar bill in there, fold it in a little tube, and then they sew you back up. Sick. They're like congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> this is for your troubles. Um, so it was fine. I was good. And, and yeah, I still I take thyroid medicine every day. Yeah, it was scary it's still, though, man. It's, yeah, and it's weird. I mean, it sucks. Like, you definitely feel differences in your levels. I have to get my levels checked, um, you know, every five, six months. Oh, get shit. Get my levels Rest checked. And we have to change my stuff. And yeah. Change your diet up and all that shit. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And just change the the the, the, the dose yeah. of, the, of the thyroid medicine. So the rest of your life going to be on that. Yeah. Um. My wife had to come home real quick. She's gonna, we're gonna get lunch with her soon, but she had to come in the only room in the house where the podcast is happening and clank dishes together and organize the only room we're in. There's a thousand rooms in this house, and she chose to come into the kitchen where the podcast is to clank glasses. Yeah, to clank glasses and she, or almost done. Was, she's, she's doing percussion. Out, um, so Chad, how many years now has Newfound Glory been together? You're like one of the sound effects people in the old movies. Ding, ding, Your ding, podcast ding. is tonight, so we'll down. Yes. Um, how yeah. how many years has Newfound Glory been together for now? Let me see you do the math. What year is it? 2019? Yeah. 97, so 22 years. Wow. Pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy, Our man. first EP came out in 97. I know. Um, is there stuff that wild. other, um, any regrets you have? Any regrets? Yeah. Ones that I'll mention on, on air? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 There's so many regrets in um, life. I know, no, but career-wise, I, I get that question to everybody, and it's a hard answer. And people give me the answers, but it got mm. a little deep a couple of times. You don't have to answer that one. Well, I'll answer. tell you a real regret. All right. I mean, it's silly, but this is real. Okay. I still get upset. I could still get upset about it, like in the middle of the day, like, like you know, in your feelings. Moving away up. from uh, the Morrison's. Yeah, so, so Universal Studios, Florida <laughs> was opening. Okay. Okay. I had a friend named Adam Whitney at the time. He was my best friend. So opening Universal Studios day, I also had tickets to Royal Rumble and Miami Arena, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior. That's sick. Right? With my mom and my brother. It was Adam Whitney, my best friend at the time, said, hey, I have tickets to Universal Studios for the grand opening. It was the same night as Royal Rumble. Damn. Because of peer pressure, I went with Adam Whitney. I have been to Universal Studios... 5,000 million times. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't get to see, I didn't get to go with my mom and my brother Damn. to see Hulk Hogan win the Royal Rumble. And this is probably 89 or something. That's I got to look at the date. And that, that's a, what's a, he not supposed to win? Hogan? Yeah. No, he, he was always supposed to win, but it was like, it was iconic. It was like, you know, that era. You know what yeah. I mean? It'd be like seeing like, who, who would have, I don't know. Robert Smith, Boys Don't Cry tour. Yes. Did you see like that at, tour? At moment? CBGB's or something. Oh, freak, she saw that at tour. At CBG, you know, the thing. It yeah. was like Hogan wins Royal Rumble. It's an iconic. You can still see the highlights on things. He's like waving the flag. And it's and like. You had a ticket. I had a ticket, and my best friend invited me to go, and he invited me to go to Universal Studios for grand opening. So I can say I went to Universal Studios the first day it opened. But who cares? Hulk, so I still, like right yeah. now, I'm getting upset inside. Damn. Like, I can't control my feelings, <laughs> my emotions. <laughs> That's like going to see Minor Threat and Ian X is up on stage and hands a marker out to the kids in the crowd, and you yes. miss that day. Yes. But I, I will say, and I'll get a little weird here. I'm going to get a little weird. Yes, please. Regrets, right? I feel like, you know, like, we, we all have regrets, but we all know that we've learned the most in life by those failures. Yes. Mistakes. And, and I don't think any of us want to have regrets. I don't think it's good to go, let's make a bunch of mistakes you want to strive. You build our character up. And you yeah, no, <laughs> you don't do that. You don't do that. Yeah. But everything's redeemable. And I think yeah. it's all part of what makes us who we are. I and agree. our story. So when I do have those regrets, I try to 
think about what I learned from that. From those mistakes. Instead of okay. guilt. What did you learn? What Moon, you got to talk learn? in the mic. This has been a great podcast. You're going to fucking ruin it. What did you learn from this thing? Going to happened? Universal Studios? Yes. What did I learn? No more, ladies and gentlemen. I learned that someone else's um, perception of me, whether they think I'm cool or not, or whether they will be my friend or not, is not based on what I do for them. It's uh, real friendship is... That's a great... Yeah, so for him, I was like, oh, I got to go Universal so Adam still likes me. If I don't go, is Adam still going to be... You don't let him down. Is he going to be my friend? Is he going to whatever? I want to go with Adam. Is and he then still your friend? Approval. No. <laughs> oh! This was, this was like when I was like seven this is like, or nine. I, no. I probably didn't talk to him six months after that. Yeah. Especially at that age too. Like yeah, you have so many friends. Yeah. yeah. But and at that it moment great. it was important to you. It was that great. moment it was important to you in your yeah. family life. Yeah, yeah. But now looking back, it would have been way more better to see that part yes. of history. And to go with my mom and have that experience with my brother. Yeah. But sometimes you miss moments with family because you're like back especially back then when you're a kid, you know, like uh like I remember the first time my mom took me to the movie. Well, my mom took me to movies many times, but the first time I asked to not sit with my mom. Ooh, how old were you? Um my mom took me with a bunch of my friends. I was probably like 11 or 12 you know that makes sense it's age that, yeah you know and i was like with all of them like mom i'm gonna sit in the front of my friends and she's yeah, like all right i'm gonna go that. home and i'll pick you back up oh yeah that made me sad i mean that's another that's another thing about being in the band too is the sacrificing and you missing people's weddings and funerals and like we're, we're traveling yeah. and doing living our dream and back home things are really happening in real life that you miss those for sure sacrifices being in the band 100 percent. um tons do you consider yourself an optimist or pessimist what are the definitions? I'm negative. negative I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist all day. Negative, positive, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Always. Yeah, you've always been like that. But I think there, I am, but I think, you know, what's funny is, is that I've learned that, um, so I've learned two things. Well, I've learned something about it is like, <clears throat> uh, it's good to be an optimist for sure, right? But it's also, so my problem is that I know things will be okay. Like, so like when my father, <clears throat> when my father got cancer, it was the happiest moments of his life. So how do you, be negative when cancer made your dad closer with everybody mm, right so i have a great point you know what i'm saying so like yeah. that was my dad you know with terminal cancer he was amazing those seven years that was the best years of his life so how can the best years of your life be when you have terminal cancer wow there should be your worst right yeah so of course that makes me an optimist yeah right but yeah. i've learned now that i'm older that you can be an optimist and still you still have to get your feelings out. So sometimes I race, I race through feelings. Like okay. I'll go, I know things are going to be okay. Right. So <laughs> I don't, you know, yeah. You know what I mean? I yeah. don't allow myself to be sad. Yeah. Right. So I'm like, all right, I know things are going to be okay. So it's all good. Like I know it's going to be fine. So I focus on that, which helps. And I could get through those things. Cause I know I believe in like the redemptive side of things. I believe yeah. in like all that. So, but I do think even though you're an optimist, it's good to make sure if you, you know, are cry or feel through things, that doesn't mean you don't think things are going to be fine. Yeah. It's still good to process the feelings. That's how you deal with them too. Yeah. Even though, even though, you know, it's good to have both. Yeah. Not pessimist. Not pessimistic. Not yeah, I, don't yeah, believe, yeah. I don't believe in, yeah. in that, you know. Yeah. That, that, that's a really good. Yeah. To make sure you still like, all right, like I know things will be fine, but. I still can be sad about it. Of course. Which is a weird thing, you know. It's how you it's how you, it's how you get through those dark times to make to make them better, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not all of a sudden it's great. Yeah. Um how many daily rituals? Daily rituals? Um so my daily rituals are I wake up at around I say eight, eight thirty. I go and I um get a coffee and I work um from about eight thirty um, break for lunch and I'm done working at around three thirty four. This is what kind of stuff are you working on? Um, everything from, uh, flyering, promoting, yep. um, personal work, like, yep. you know, house stuff or, yep. or just planning, whatever real it life is. Dem- real life, real life, shit, life stuff. Shit. Um, band, new f- planning, yeah. touring, uh, content, creating, um, then movie gang stuff, creating that, yep. doing those things, then the festival stuff. Yeah. So I make, I, I really focus on that till about four, three thirty. Yeah. Four, go home, get on my workout gear, go to kickboxing. Awesome. Kickbox from five thirty to six thirty. Shower at the gym, go eat dinner, go home. 
Watch well, TV. I love that. <laughs> Watch That's TV. Amazing. That's, That's amazing. That's like though. the regular thing. Yeah. You know. But but that life that you're living, you built that from a kid playing music who left school, <laughs> joined bands and just started playing music and you know took a chance and didn't graduate and and now you get to live by your own rules. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. And when, Wednesday nights. I'm a youth leader, which I told you. Yeah. It's my second year. It's awesome. Um, what is what is that what is that job entitled? Like, what do you do? So basically, well, when you get there, the first hour. You know, that's like outside to play basketball, hang out with everybody. Yeah. But um, I hang out with, now they're 10th graders. And it's basically, it's a topic and they talk about their life. They talk about yeah. school. They talk about their peer pressures. They talk about, you know, things in their head. and You're like and a counselor their, kind of? Yeah. And, awesome. and you just kind of like talk through it to them and, you know, talk about life. You know, awesome. where a kid would be like, you know, um, you know, I remember two weeks ago it was, we did this thing where we had this bonfire yeah, we had this fire, and we'd encourage the kids to write things that they wanted to basically leave behind on their sticks. Got gotcha. you. And they threw it in the fire to symbolize and burning it. And awesome. then we talked about it. And, yeah. You know, like so, a kid, one of his kid, one of his was like lust. Mm. This little kid, you know. Yeah. And it was like important to talk to him about like, you know, um, the root of that, you know, yeah. and, and get down to like him being okay with being attracted to somebody and mm -hmm. the difference between you know a positive way and a negative totally. way and and encouraging them that their worth should not be through whether the other person's perception of them and, yeah and their own you know you know what i'm saying it's yeah, like yeah. you kind of get digging deep and and i love it because it's really grounding for me too because yeah. you know i'm like worried about the band or worry about something this and then i get in a room and i'm hanging out with my friend carl who is a 10th grader who um <laughs> was adopted from haiti Wow. And he's like, yeah, I remember when the earthquake happened and I almost died. Some different realities in people's lives. Yes. Yeah. You're hanging out, you know, who's like psyched to get Sonic after, you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, like it's like, it's, yeah. it's awesome, you know, it's, yeah. it's really uplifting and cool to, to be able to be like, you know, a and, mentor. And, yeah, yeah. And I walk around town and there'll be regular old moms like, Hey chat. So how's Sam doing? Or how's yeah. this kid doing? Or how's it, you know? And you're like, Oh, he's doing good. You yeah. know, like, so it's really fun. It's Some cool. of that small town, small town life is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's fun. Especially all the stuff you do in the community where, like you said, nobody knows you're in a band or what you've done your whole entire life. And maybe <laughs> that's Chad is putting on the movies and doing that kind of stuff. It's yeah. awesome. Um, and then how many years have you been doing the break fest for? This is our second year. Okay. Yeah, second year. And it's a festival you hold, you hold it there in the town? Yep, I hold it there and I, I get all the local coffee shops and food places involved. Same with the movie stuff? Yep. Yeah. And it's kind of like, the, the goal is to kind of create like, you know, I love Disney World, so it's kind of like the the atmosphere. It's really cool. Yeah, because you walk in and you're just in this different land. It's yeah. not. It's like the the lighting is really cool, and then we have these screens where we project all like breakfast influence stuff, and then cool. all the there's donuts and food, and we have floaties of donuts. And, yeah, and it's just like this whole like little world for a day. I love and, it. And and there's not really any pressure on headliners or yeah. like the people love a little bit of each band. You know, but they're there for the whole thing. Yeah. Like they're there to eat breakfast. It's an event. Brunch. It's, it's a hang. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really cool. So it's the second year and, you know, we're, you know, growing each year. Like awesome. we got more sponsors this year than we did last year. Yeah. More involvement, more giveaways and things like that. So you pretty much moved there and took over this town. Pretty much. That's the goal. It's pretty much. They I, do I mean, tease me and they're like, you're the mayor. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Um, Danny Boy from House of Pain just... He moved to the town and bought the original house from Outsiders, his favorite movie. That is He's awesome. He's like the mayor of that town, too. <laughs> and he brought all this new revenue to the community, he rebuilt it. All the actors are coming there. It's like a museum. I'm so happy for him. He lives in that town now. That they is think so Tulsa, cool. Oklahoma. Really? Yeah. That is awesome. So that's like a super movie thing, like you guys, yeah. you know. Um, well, my whole thing is I don't, it's not, but, you know, and I know you're teasing, but the whole thing about what I'm doing there is just to give, it, it's like, it's kind of like with with us and punk and being straight edge, yeah. Right? You're like, oh, if you have tattoos and you're cr you're crazy, you're a partier. So it's kind of like that. Like I, you, you know, I walk around and I'm like, yep. you know, there, there's a lot of like Looks middle middle America yeah. people. You know, we live in the Bible Belt. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of people that aren't used to do to full tattoos. Yeah. Walk. Still, I'm like, oh, by the way, you know, I'm like, I work and help the Downtown Franklin Association, and yeah, I never tried drugs or alcohol. I, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> so it's really cool, and, I like and that. because there's you know, I think a lot of that is like, oh, youth culture is wild. You know, younger culture is wild. You know, so it's like, no, like we can do a movie night with all college age kids to young adults, yeah. you know, that love 
Big Trouble in Little China. I love that. And do this crazy, you know, have this. So that's whole. That's kind of my goal. Because even with me, like I, I, I don't want to bring a wild festival. No. You know, like I know, I'm like I want it to be controlled and fun. Yeah. And really cool and a good vibe and different than anywhere else. Yeah. Because it's like I don't want to. I just kind of I, I want to put a I wanted to put on a festival that was still very Franklin. Yeah. But with a little twist, you know. Yeah, with your yeah, with stuff you love in it. So that's what's cool is just kind of being that, engaging that younger, you no, know, I love society. That. I there. think you're connecting and you're building this community and you're giving back to the community also, you know. Yeah. Um, and then also you guys just drop uh, screen to the stereo part three. Yeah, today. So, so, so today it dropped release day. So you have three different cover albums basically. Yes, this is the third. Um, and I saw you guys perform last night. Yesterday at Amoeba, which is really cool. I've never seen a band perform there. That's awesome. And if you've ever been to Amoeba, there's different aisles. So people in each aisle, someone's in, someone's in M, N, L, P, whatever these aisles, and the kids are singing, and it's awesome. It's just a good vibe. And um, yeah, and so you guys covered a bunch of bands, and, w- and one of the bands you have on YouTube, and that one's gone now, right? That's correct? Yeah, The Power of Love. We covered uh, Power <laughs> of Love from Back to the Future. And there was too many, simi- too, too many similarities of how you guys looked or the sound or the images. Yeah, we did a lot of like reenactment of like the video of the movie with um, stop motion animation oh, with shit. the toys and things. But and you got on the radar. Know, yeah, it got on the radar, and we got <laughs> we got in trouble a little bit. Not, but I will tell you that it wasn't like bad. You know, it, it was definitely more of like a a light warning. Yeah, a little it tap. It was a polite warning. A little tap. Yeah. So like, which, please, which is better than like we're going to come after you. Yeah, better than like. Uh, you know we're getting you yeah so i think that's awesome i think uh we did a coverage record too and just doing that stuff and being more creative also i want to mention use your voice you did also which was so fun doing that record oh, use my voice. and that was almost seven year hiatus in between you know we came out to yeah. nashville and did the, it was awesome to another great experience with you so yeah i just want to thank i mean i think we covered a lot of shit we did um so make sure we cover everything because I hate calling people back up. I actually added some, every episode I call somebody back up and have a question. Moon had a question for you. Her question yes. was, is it true you had, a, you had that first? All good? Okay. That'd be great if you didn't record any of it. All right, what were you saying before that check? Go ahead. No, I'm good, babe. 126. Yeah, you were saying something about people want to be, about what we talking about? Oh, right no, there? I was saying like with the, with what we learn in, so of course like, because we're, punk and hardcore people we think you know we know it all and we're the only ones that, yeah. that have this that's just our natural <laughs> way about us yeah. and i think that one thing i've learned is that the the way we communicate in our in our community like the punk rock diy scene yeah everybody wants that you know yeah. so i was able to like you know everyone wants to be heard everyone wants to participate they don't just want to do things because they're like they want to gain you know you, you when when you Go with go in to someone, go up to someone, or go up to a business, or go up to a community, and you're like, "Hey, you genuinely want to help out, yeah, for the passion, for the fun, yeah, and because you care about it." Like people like being involved. Hundred you know, percent. People like like participating. They feed, off, they feed off that energy. Yeah, they love it. It's attractive and it's and it's contagious. Yeah, especially positive energy. And you're putting shit out there. You want to do something good. Yeah, and like being youthful. They want to be and, part of and, it. And people want to be able to like because people don't forget that you know they get all these pressures from the outside that they have to be perfect you and, that's, know, they and that's can't what, fail they yeah. can't where we're like look at us yeah we're all know? fucked up we're, i know yeah and that's we're okay fucked up. we're doing good shit though and we'll always learn and we'll always so it's yeah. a mentality of like not being scared to try shit push yourself be yourself uh creativity all that stuff and you put that out there and you continue to do that in your, in your yeah. town where you live on and off stage you live it and i appreciate you and everything you've done in music and we've done for too. my band and the records you've done with us and our friendship and this house together and you know yeah same growing thing up here. with max and just everything you know appreciate you and h2o and and all the stuff you put out there that paved the way for us and you know kept going i don't know about moon though yeah i'm always here eating fucking <laughs> i'm always here eating some whack-ass vegan, <laughs> vegan craft macaroni or some shit I don't know what it is. I appreciate all the free popcorn you'd sneak in with the weird flavored salt on it. And yeah, well, I had the uh, yeah, I had the um, nutrition <laughs> t- nutritional yeast popcorn. I always brought in the movies in gigantic uh, brown bags, and that and that's Did like and, that, and that's like a, people love my popcorn. I, sn- I snuck into all the movies. That was a yeah, big part of our movie crew. A lot of things. I think if I ever come down and host one of your events and come down there, I like to make my own popcorn that day. You should be behind <laughs> the counter. <laughs> There's salt. It'd be awesome to serve my popcorn there um, in Tennessee. Um, we covered everything. Any questions for your mama? 
That's pretty good. We did an hour and 29 minutes. That's really good. This is awesome. We covered a lot of good shit. Did we cover some good shit? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, I think a lot of fans and people are going to be psyched to shout hear Shout out it. to your mom. Your mom's fucking awesome. She's yes. always had your back since day one. She rules. Always Jackie had your Gum. Back. Jackie Gum. And so I don't know why Max called her that when he was a kid. Maybe because she chewed gum all the time. No, she'd, she'd always mail him gum. Oh, okay. So back in the day, Chad's mom used to mail Max a bunch of gum. So he called her Jackie Gum. Yeah. That's it's a very Kentucky thing to do. My my grandma used to do that. So anything my mom didn't want me to have, my grandma would mail it. Okay. So like if you guys didn't want Max to have sugar, she would mail gum. <laughs> and that's she. You know that's what the grandparents Spoiling. do. Yeah, yeah they want to be yeah. the one. They want that connection. You know. Yeah. So she would mail them tons of gum, and Max would be like Jackie. You know Jackie yeah. gum. You know. Yeah, exactly. It worked. That's what they do, you know. Well, sure. An- another thing too, real quick, is I just talked about the outsiders. Your stay gold tattoo, and you guys pushed that whole stay gold thing for so long in your band. Yeah, nothing gold can stay. Stay yeah. gold. Yeah. So that came from that movie, obviously. Yep. Um, yeah, it, that caught on, huh? Like it this, really did, man. Yeah. I remember you guys were the first ones really pushing that. Yeah, it's it's uh, the opening, our first record, the nothing gold can stay. Yeah, it was like the sample and all that. Yeah, we uh, outsiders is you know top two it's okay, first wow. Bueller's day off and then the outsiders Danny boy would be happy yeah and then what's eating Gibber grape we touched on that for a second but that your solo band you did i thought that was really cool and the songs and the way you guys looked on stage and thank you is that gonna happen again i don't know i don't i don't know if there's really time like yeah. new, like i did that that was part of the time where i really wasn't happy in in newfound glory at the time there was a lot of mm. so i kind of filled up some space to like yeah get a little bit more of creative freedom and then once you guys emptied out the trash and kept it moving yeah once resurrection came uh, 2014 when we made that record it yeah. was like full like New Fun Glory had this rebirth and new life Rebirth the Hardcore awesome. Pride Rebirth the Hardcore Pride um, so for the listeners you think Chad you think we can go on record saying that you think there'll be another Hazen Street record or EP down the line EP for sure yeah I think so too I do too I think it's been a very easy. long time it'd be nice to get back together and maybe put something together yeah I think with the way recording is is now it's it's a lot easier to record than when we did last time yeah like I'm talking about with people living far apart yeah you know what I mean yeah and then hopefully Bridge Nine where we release it in America on vinyl that'd be awesome I was thinking Def Jam <laughs> I'm even moving so. up, even moving <laughs> up to that. We well, you know who Def Jam is, babe. Um, Tommy Boy, not a Tommy Boy. Yeah. Everybody's boycotting them now. Def, yeah, Def Jam. We pretty Def safe. Jam. Maybe. Um, what about uh, what's the one, the Ja Rule label? No, Mur- Murder Inc. Uh, Fire Festival. Um, final question: Do Do you think that the Warp Tour helped a lot of us? To get just different audiences. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, continue yeah. our longevity. I never, I never a million shot, percent. I never shot them out enough. I remember the first hard band they had was sick of it all. Then we ended up getting on there later down in the years to get hate breed. But I feel like doing those tours helped you get a whole different audience. You know what I mean? And those sampler cassettes and those sampler yeah. CDs and all Warped that. Warped Tour is amazing. Yeah, Warped yeah, really, Tour helped us so much. Yeah, it was like it was a part of our journey. Yeah, it got you in front of so many new people. Yeah. They were able to walk by and go, what's this band? Oh, this is awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it now to looking back on it. Back then, I was like, oh, you know what time you're going to play each day. Yeah. You're breaking down a Winnebago or a van or if you're in a bus, whatever you're in. It's just, it's, it's hard. It was a hard It's great tour. for your band. It's bad for you personally. Yeah. Yeah, it'll fucking, it'll put years on your life, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's um, bad, bad personally. It's, it wears you out. It's yeah. tiring. I would not work the Warp Tour for a week for 20 grand. Really? Because I was going to ask you if you want to come back out of retirement for a week for 20 Glory. grand. 20 G's, a, no. 20, grand, 20 G's a week to go and tour New Fun Glory for the Warp Tour? No. no. Damn, babe. I offered that wife swap was 20 grand. Yeah, we got offered to be on the TV show Wife Swap 20 grand. We didn't do it. I was uh, so scared. I don't want to do that shit, man. You never Live with know. some random family like in the Midwest. Yeah, and then, and then you the, the producers are in control of how you're perceived on TV. Ooh. And then you're like, eh. Yeah, then you all of a sudden you're like that guy. Oh yeah, forever Shit. for for that. Nah, not worth it. Oh yeah, one more thing. When we had cribs downstairs, that was really cool. You had me on there. That was awesome. He had all the hardcore shit in there, <laughs> yes. giving props and shit. It was awesome, yes. man. That was so funny. I was so young, and I was like, man, if I'm gonna cribs, I'm gonna show my records. And it I was got awesome, to do though. it. Yeah, man. Like that's like your concern. That was my concern. I gotta show my records. <laughs> it wasn't like jewelry or fucking <laughs> yeah. cars or nothing. Yeah. Check out my seven inch from Revelation. That's so funny. Um. I think we covered off. If people want more, then hit me up. We'll do a part two someday. But I want to do Chad in person because he's a good friend of mine. It sucks doing these things over the phone. I've done it with a bunch of friends. <laughs> that's, that's what it she takes, said. It takes, <laughs> you go, I wanted to do it with... <laughs> I, wait, 
I want to do it with Chad in person, not do it over the phone. It sucks when it's over the phone. I do it with a bunch of my friends over the phone. <laughs> this guy's mind. Um, you guys know what I mean, but it's just the office. Yeah, That's but one on one, that one on one, it's so much. It's so awesome. It is. This to get. Okay, <laughs> in our clothes at the kitchen table, with my wife watching. Uh, uh, whatever, fuck. You know what I mean? It's great to have you here, Chad. Thanks for being on no, the podcast. Thank you. We cover a lot. I'm super proud of you and your journey, everything you've done. Thank you. Thanks for having um, me. Here. Even though you didn't get your GED, you're fucking. <laughs> you're, you're a smart kid who fucking, you know, you paved your way and you fucking followed your heart and, and you do great things. And thanks, bud. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. This is Chad Gilbert. Th- Chad, anything you want to plug? Uh, no. The record's thanks, out. Thanks, Toby, for doing this. This is awesome. Thanks, Moon, for taking off work so we can follow go to lunch. X, follow X, Chad Ball X everywhere. Yep. Um, fuck. My wife just slapped Toby's my tattoo. Toby's scratching his... Uh, Laser tattoo. Moon has slapped me. Um, so I love you, Chad. We love you. Love and hey, you too. Um, we miss you living in California. We had some great times out here. And um, it's always good to see you. It's awesome. Next time love the grass you. will be greener. You. Yep. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening. Hey, guys. Uh, as you can see, the podcast has got a little off track as far as chronological order concern- is concerned. And the reason that is because, one, it was really... Uh, I was being super anal... And tedious about it, and all the, all the time, all the time frames and stuff. And then when I started hearing the quality be, 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 between uh, being in person and being over the phone, the over the phone really, really, for me, uh, it sucks. And the sound can be off, and you don't get the same uh, connection, you don't get the same vibe, the same flow. So I am sitting on about forty six episodes I have not released yet. There's quite a few of them that are phone call ones. So what I'm trying to do is redo these conversations in person whenever I get out to the whenever I get out to these people's cities. And so that's why you know after I hit New York with all my New York people, it went to some other people. But bottom line is every single person I'm having on this podcast has 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 impacted my life in some sort of positive way. They've been a friend or I've been a fan of their music. So either way, it's still it's still my story, but. As far as like sticking to New York, yeah, I'm probably have to go back and drop a couple more New York episodes because there's still friends I have not spoken to yet, and there's still friends I need to redo because, like I said, the phone call thing is uh, I'm not, I'm not feeling the vibe at all. So, but I appreciate you guys' support. I appreciate you guys um, t- spreading the word about this podcast, reviewing it, subscribing to it. I'm getting the most incredible feedback from all the interviews I've done so far. Um, This has been so fun. It's been such a journey. It's been very therapeutic. And I look forward to you guys hearing all the ones I'm sitting on right now. And I'm looking forward to getting more with other people. Um, I have a huge freaking list. I have a wish list. I have all this stuff. And I'm hoping to get through it all. I'm in no hurry. Just when I get somebody's time, I'll get their time. Um, But yeah. So as far as like this order is concerned, yes, mentally I'm still trying to do it. But I'd rather have quality uh, episodes they may not be in order of people that I love that inspire me than have somebody in the order that kind of sounds like shit and it's not like 100% conversation that I really wanted to have. I need to be happy with these um, just as much as the person I'm interviewing yeah, is. We both have to be happy. So and I don't want it to sound good for you guys and I'm really getting better at uh, people on the microphone. It's funny because my partner Joe Bajan told me that I interview all these singers and my wife can't sing one fucking note And she sounds the best on the microphone. It's pretty fucking ironic. Anyway, love you guys. Thanks for the support. Peace.